we are worrying about a bush, you know, where our song lines and our history, our stories gonna just wiped out. Climate change is making us all hotter and angry and um, frustrated. So, you know, it's frustrating for everyone involved. We could be doing so much more and it's too late to stop it, it's too late to prevent it, it's already happening now and we need to start doing something now or five years ago to start reducing these emissions. My soul just goes out to them and it should never have happened. Between the territory and the people that are they need to sit down as a group and really look at it and talk about it. Is there any way we can assist them? There's a, there's a lot that we can offer them. We need to think a bit more laterally and, uh, you know, I've seen this happening in other parts of the world as well where Indigenous people are taking the lead and not waiting for governments and others, but we do need to work, I think, a lot more quickly in a partnership way. In good wet season years, the billabongs around Minyeri provide the Alawa people with plenty of bush tucker. They collect water lily stalks. It's like a salary. We just and seeds. It's a flower, we grind it and make damper with it. Many families live on welfare and depend on bush food in the off payment weeks. Because we can come back all the time to our land where there is free homeland and free food, which it doesn't cost a dollar. The land is also rich in medicine plants. They strip the plants and boil them up to make soap. But 2019 was the Northern Territory's second hottest, driest year on record. After a series of hot years, traditional owner Naomi Wilfred has noticed other longer term changes. Hardly any rain or wet season come around, so that's changed a lot. And plus we didn't have no any fruit this year, bush berries and plums, um, our lily, um, lily roots from the billabongs are now gone. The country's health is intertwined with her people's cultural health. We are worrying about a bush, you know, our song lines and our history, our stories gonna just wiped out. This um, the canoe, you're looking for uh, the turtle and jiggle, and this dolphin too. At the coast, indigenous communities are worried about the impact of rising sea temperatures on marine ecosystems. On Groot Island in the Gulf of Carpentaria, the Anandiliaqua people's ancient rock art records their dependence on the ocean. The islands have some of Australia's most biodiverse waters and rich prawn and barramundi fisheries. In recent years, more regular marine heat waves have caused coral bleaching here. And I've dived in these areas, free diving right down to 14 metres, and some of the coral down there is just white. Water has been boiling on both sides of the end of the island and it's, it's as hot as a hot bath. They've noticed the effects on fish. Places I've fished for a whole year, the sharks have just come on in bigger numbers. And I think it's because the bait's getting sparse. On the Gulf of Carpentaria's Lemon Bite, traditional owners have been shocked by how climate changes have combined to cause devastating impacts. In 2015, Mara traditional owner Patsy Evans discovered mangroves along a thousand kilometres of coastline were dying. 
because of prolonged hot, dry conditions, sea temperature rise, and a temporary drop in the sea level caused by a change in the trade winds. These are long bums. As you can see, they normally end up under the trees, but they're dying. Since then, there's been little regeneration. Oh, this is bad. It's um, unbelievable. can't even believe what's happening. It just makes me feel sad. Patsy Evans wants policymakers to look at what's happening on her country. Go out and see what's happening. Go out there and be aware and look at it. And don't make decisions where you are. The federal government's science agency is predicting global warming will increase by about another degree within the next 10 years, on top of the current one degree rise we've already had, and that the international community isn't on track to meet its Paris Emissions Reduction Agreement commitment to limit the warming to two degrees. We'll see uh, more like three to three and a half degrees of global warming by the end of the century. If we're experiencing some of the extreme climate and weather conditions now under one degree warming, we, it, it's almost hard to imagine how dire the extreme events could become because it's not just the extreme events occurring, it's the frequency with which they're occurring. Another change threatening coastal ecosystems and communities is sea level rise. Vast areas of Kakadu National Park's World Heritage freshwater wetlands are just above sea level. The CSIRO has predicted in 50 years, half of Kakadu's wetlands will be inundated by saltwater, and all of them in just over 100 years. During years working as a park ranger, Bunnich traditional owner Jonathan Nagy has watched saltwater creep more than 100 kilometres inland. In the wet season, we get a lot of spring tides, and this is what basically causing a lot of damages to the floodplain and stuff, pushing saltwater into the floodplain, into the freshwater area, basically killing a lot of freshwater um, species and stuff, like long neck turtle, fire snakes. Just like on Australia's east coast, for Jonathan Nagy, it's been much more intense bushfires, which have caused the biggest climate shock. Plains are basically going over the top of the trees. He and his wife Dion tried to defend their son's house when wildfire swept into Kakadu's unstaffed East Alligator Ranger Station in 2019. He tried to fight the fire in a truck with a water tank on the back. Basically, this wasn't normal. It was very scary. Uh, I, was, I was basically, yeah, really, really fearing for my partner and myself. I thought we were going to basically, yeah, get burnt. So now and then what I would do is spray the truck with the water and I would spray myself and try to put the fire out. But it got to the stage where it was just too much for me. And I just thought maybe just now it's time to just back off and try and save some of the things. He's noticed fires becoming more destructive all across the park. A lot of things that are basically dying from hot fires, floodplain, you got the Ely cars that basically produce a lot of food for, you know, make by geese. Wild rice, that's basically vanishing. So you're getting less and less bird life around this country here. So there's signs already there. It's telling us, it's being gentle with us, it's being nice and respectful. It's trying to show us, here, I'm here now. Please start act now. Don't act too late. This is where everybody's acting too late. Issues affecting Indigenous people, particularly in Northern and Central Australia, are exacerbated by people having poor health and also poor infrastructure in particular. And uh, I think changes in, in climate really exacerbate that and uh, make, uh, make it very difficult for Indigenous people to, to cope. Al Yawaraman and Central Land Councillor Michael Little wants more information to be provided to Indigenous communities about why it's getting hotter and drier. This was once one of the lush spring-fed waterholes that his people depended on as they travelled across the desert. We've had two hot summers with 45 degree heat, 10 to 20, 20 days in a row. Unheard of before. Creeks don't run. Soakages are no longer full. They're not even moist. 
The Central Land Council also wants more help for remote communities like Yundamu, which are running out of water as aquifers dwindle. We need to get the remote people of Central Australia understanding that you can't sing a song to bring clouds to make rain. It doesn't happen like that no more. And it wants disadvantaged communities suffering heat stress to be provided with more appropriate housing. We've been thrown this substandard housing, substandard living quarters. It doesn't, when it's hot, the houses are hot. Climate change is making us all hotter and angry and um, frustrated. When I emerged, I think I was out of my mind. I wasn't really sure where I was. I didn't recognise the scene. This is where I've been living for a little while. In 1974, the 250 kilometre an hour winds of Category 4 Cyclone Tracy demolished three quarters of Darwin. The models are telling us that we probably won't get more cyclones, but the cyclones that we do get are more likely to be more intense. So more of those Category 4s and Category 5s, there's even a move to bring in a new category, Category 6. Category 6 cyclone would have wind gusts stronger than the current forecasting upper limit of 279 kilometres an hour. Off the Arnhem Land coast, Elko Island communities hit by Category 4 cyclone Lam in 2015 want more help to be ready for more frequent, stronger systems. Lam destroyed 80 houses on the island. They have to look more into it and get a proper, proper structure and a design for to, to could survive through the cyclone, you know, and more shelters have to be built, you know. What I mean? Many remote communities are in the same situation. So in 2019, fearing Cyclone Trevor would hit Gulf of Carpentaria communities as a Category 4, the Northern Territory and federal governments carried out a mass evacuation. The temporary move to safety was welcomed by remote residents. But they worry about how much and how long governments will be willing to pay to defend and rebuild their communities as the demands on its disaster budget grow. It, 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 it really worries me. I mean, it, it, it's something that you can't force people to leave. You know? I mean, we need to have that funding or that resources in place for the next greater one that comes in or the, whether it's the sea, sea level rise, whether it's cyclone coming in, there's something that it's have to be implemented by the people in power to say that we have this budget. When you look at the response to the bushfires, the amount of money the federal government's had to put into those in the billions and how that's going to impact the economy, um, I think that that's very much a concern. But Australia's indigenous people have adapted to massive climate changes in the past. Former Larrakia Nation ranger Donna Jackson is proud of her coastal ancestors' history of being flexible and able to move as the sea rose after the last ice age. Knowing that Darwin Harbour was a freshwater valley 6,000 years ago, obviously our mob just slowly retreated. And if you were, if we were able to get down there on that seafloor and have a look, there'd be shell middens and things that showed that change, that gradual change. But I guess what's worrying for us now is that the change isn't being so gradual. It seems to be uh, speeding up again. It's an adaptability she thinks policymakers are going to have to reconsider quickly. And that governments should start planning to help assist people to move away from areas at high risk from intensifying cyclones, floods and bushfires. Yeah, look, it's a sensitive issue because people have lost everything and they, they want to have that feeling that we, we can do this, we can build again, but I'd say think twice. Um, sorry that you lost your things and maybe your pets and your livestock, but try not to maybe put yourself in that same place again if, if it's possible. You know, and some people can't sell. They're, they're locked into that piece of land. So, I mean, that's where we need a bit more flexibility with the authorities and the councils to go, OK, maybe this valley or this, this place is a bit safer. Let's just leave that place alone and, and see what happens. Larakia elder June Mills thinks much of modern society has forgotten how to live sustainably with the environment. She often paints the dreaming in which the Larakia people came out of the land. All the Larakia people will refer to themselves as 
Dangalaba, crocodile. Right. I can't really explain it, but there's a, it's almost like we're blood brothers or something like that. Her paintings show how her ancestors had to use the resources of their country carefully, manage fire and stay alert to extreme weather. Our environment had to be constantly cared for and maintained so you didn't get into that situation because you can't run with babies and old people and, and, and run in front of these fires or whatever you have to do. They have to be kept and it was a constant vigil and a constant maintenance. She thinks modern society needs to relearn her ancestors' attitude to living and consuming. What's wrong with leading the way? Really, um, you know, setting the bar as high as possible rather than just doing the minimum of what we need to just shut people up and pretend that we're doing something right and at the meantime we'll be uh, profiteering off um, destructive um, ways of making money and, and energy. We need to really be looking at renewables and, and putting all our energy and our ideas and our thing into stuff that's sustainable, that's safe, that's clean. In 2009, while leading the peak body for Northern Australia's ranger groups, Joe Morrison was commissioned by the federal government to report on how Indigenous communities needed to be prepared for climate change. Well, there hasn't been a, a, a real response. I mean, unfortunately, when it comes to involving Indigenous people in designing public policy, uh, it's been too piecemeal and ad hoc. Here it goes. Joe Morrison feels his recommendations on how Australia could benefit from Indigenous knowledge are even more relevant now. That there are opportunities uh, that come out of these adverse situations and we need to think a bit more laterally and uh, you know I've seen this happening in other parts of the world as well where Indigenous people are taking the lead uh, and not waiting for governments and others but we do need to work I think a lot more quickly in a partnership way. Point northeast of Darwin, the Larrakia Rangers are working on a partnership with the CSIRO to help measure how fast global greenhouse gas emissions are rising. And we're making some really good um, connections worldwide with some of the other CSIRO partners. But it's given them a worrying perspective. We could be doing so much more and it's too late to stop it, it's too late to prevent it, it's already happening now and we need to start doing something now or five years ago to start reducing these emissions. In central Arnhem Land, every year the Mimal Rangers carry out controlled burns in the cool early dry season. These fires remove the undergrowth without destroying everything in their path. And by the hot, late dry season, when wildfires threaten remote communities and biodiversity, they've created a patchwork of fire breaks in the landscape. When we st the fire season come, we normally go out to all the outstation. We put a fire break around the old outstations and the airport as well. We put a fire break around that. We'll do our burning so that all the animals have their habitat not burned by wild, late wildfires. Jeremy Russell Smith helped the rangers to prove that as well as reducing wildfires, they're preventing millions of tonnes of greenhouse gases being released by these big blazes. And we put up a proposition that if we could um, reduce the uh, incidence of late dry season wildfires through large parts of Arnhem Land by uh, reintroducing and supporting Indigenous uh, traditional practices, particularly focused on early dry season, low intensity, small patchy burns, we would be able to reduce emissions on an industrial scale. 29 Indigenous ranger groups across Northern Australia are now being paid by the federal government and private companies to prevent 1.2 million tonnes of emissions each year, the equivalent of taking 400,000 cars off the road. I'm so proud to be working on my homeland really, you know, it's bringing me a lot of pride. In 2019, the rangers' resources were stretched to breaking point 
by a fire season which shocked everyone with its intensity and destructive power. This has been a pretty horrendous fire skip season. This year is a completely different year and we've done probably five, six times the level of fire fighting than we would in a normal year. There's a big changes in fire in the late season. I mean, it goes on for, you know, for months or more. Um, but the hot, hotness of it, it's really tiring. It wears you out mentally, physically. They worry they won't have enough resources as climate change makes bushfires more severe. We've clear that what used to be sort of one in 10 year challenging events are more likely to be two or three times in a 10 year period. And really the back to back years of that is what's pretty tough and we're not funded and we're not equipped to deal with that kind of firefighting in the same way that um, people interstate aren't equipped to deal with the level of fires and challenges that are happening at the moment. But they're keen to share their knowledge with East Coast communities interstate who've suffered devastating losses. In fires which forced major evacuations, destroyed thousands of homes and killed dozens of people. My son just goes out to them, you know, to those people out there, and it shouldn't have ever happened. The damage it has done is enormous. Um, I feel sorry for the people, I feel sorry for the animals and the land itself. I guess between the territory and the people that sat, they need to sit down and, as a group and really look at it and talk about it. Is there any way we can assist them? There's a, there's a lot that we can offer them. Sure, you know, one of the principles is you know, fuel reduction um, burning, but how does fuel reduction burning in a savannah landscape relate to a big forest situation in southeast Australia? I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of sort of fundamental, pragmatic and ecological questions which need to be addressed. It's not, you know, there's not a blanket lesson that can be applied from the north. But I, I do take a lot of encouragement from the fact that agencies and Indigenous communities are very keen to work together. The Rangers are worried their work reducing emissions is being offset by Australia's continued expansion of fossil fuel projects. At a certain limit, you know. <laughs> but when you go to a fire, you feel the changes, you know, within the climate itself. And they have deeper cultural concerns. We believe there's a spiritual thing out there and it's really powerful. And it's, it's way dangerous. That's why a lot of us now these days are saying no, 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 no to mining in it. And when you start mucking around with the land, you're gonna, there's consequences, you're gonna suffer, you know? Indigenous people from all over Australia have been increasing pressure on the Australian and state governments to reduce emissions and to stop approving more fossil fuel developments. Destroying our land, destroying our water for a future generation. A national youth indigenous network have been at the forefront of helping organise some of Australia's climate protests in coordination with young people around the world. We should be empowering Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be, you know, creating the first solar, community-owned solar, community-owned wind power. You know, we have the solutions and um, climate change needs to be reframed for us so we can get involved. They're particularly opposing plans to develop an onshore gas industry in the Northern Territory to rival the United States' massive shale gas developments. The Northern Territory government has estimated this new industry could produce emissions equivalent to 22% of Australia's current emissions every year. You know, this is the only planet we got. You know, we need to fight for it and stand up and protect it. We need to come together as a nation and work on transitioning into clean power because Australia is one of the biggest countries on the planet for supplying fossil fuels and we've got to stop that. In our Kyoto Agreement, we achieved our targets, and in fact, we achieved much more than that. And we are continuing to look at renewable energies. And the work that is being done in collaboration with other ministers uh, is significant. And certainly as uh, Minister for Indigenous Australians, I want to see our people involved in those in all aspects so that if there is derived economic opportunities, then I want to see them benefit as equally. We're a fairly innovative nation, 
And I, and I think we should place our trust in that and, and identify the challenge and respond to the challenge rather than say, it's too difficult and we're, we're not going to be part of the game. We've got to be a leader internationally on how the world is going to survive and on what our contribution to the survival of the world is going to be. This is the main campsite, uh, up the top there, like I showed you before. Jonathan Naji's East Alligator Country in Kakadu is full of his family's history and their memories about how they helped some of the first starving European explorers survive here in the 1800s. McKinley and his group walked up there through that valley and when they got there my grandfather came out with spears and he had his all his group there watching and um, they both uh, McKinley froze and he didn't know what to say. My grandfather actually looked after him for a couple of months until they, he gained weight. They lost a lot of people on that trail. It's where they've documented technological changes. It's an aeroplane painting. That's when they first saw an aeroplane fly over top of them. Jonathan Naji's country speaks to him and it's warning him more changes are coming. Cyclones, wind, hot fires, heat, you know, that's, that, those are the signs that basically here and trying to show us that, but we just basically not, we're not looking deeper into it. There are signs he wants the community and policy makers to respond to, to make sure future generations can continue to live here. Once the government start getting the public involved and start listening, I think then that's when we'll start changing things. But at the moment, you've got the government doing its own thing, you've got traditional land to do its own thing, but in actual fact, they're turning their blind eye on the main issue that is out there. And I think we need to start looking at that and start working together on that. It's a partnership governments are starting to show an interest in, but the clock is ticking as we head down an increasingly catastrophic path.